All right, it's nine o'clock. Uh, just like last week, this is this won't take a long time. Uh, let, me, just, let me get some things out of the way. Cool. Yeah, this won't take too long. Excellent. So welcome back to uh, module two of CNET 121. Uh, this is the same class I teach at Cabrillo. It's just called CIS 77. Uh, so if you see the CIS 77 and stuff, don't worry, it's the same class. It's just what college is uh, that class is being taught at. Um, if you haven't already received your GCP credit, please uh, ask me in Discord. Uh, you should not need to use your credit card at all to use the, the cloud platform for this course. It should be uh, zero, zero dollars spent on your end. I have enough credit that every student uh, is able to run all the virtual machines needed for the entire course. So if you haven't done that yet, please reach out to me on Discord and I'll get you a code and you'll be on your way. Uh, Google restricts up to five uh, codes per account. So if for whatever reason you uh, use up the code I give you and for others, just make another dummy Gmail and I'll give you more codes and you're able to continue on that account. Piece of cake. Either way, you should not have to use your credit card or spend any money, any of your money to do the work uh, required for this course. With that, let us uh, get into the short lecture and then we'll have some time if anybody still has issues uh, getting on Discord or getting themselves set up on the cloud. This uh, chapter is more dealing with, uh, well, part of it will be dealing with hardware and part of it will be dealing with Windows. Just uh, like some, some important areas to look at um, that we'll come back to later when we're actually working in cases. So a strong foundation in operating systems is an important building block in becoming an effective forensics investigator. The evidence that investigators work with are files. The organization of these files the data they contain and their locations will vary according to the operating system and associated file systems that exist. As a defining term, a file system is a hierarchy of files and their respective directories. Like I said, this module will focus uh, mostly on the file system supported by Microsoft. An investigator like yourselves should understand the allocated stored space, which is an area on a volume where files are stored. The unallocated file space, the free data for data to be written. And partition, a, log a logical storage unit on a disk. As a refresher, a byte is eight bits, zeros or ones and is the smallest addressable unit in memory. A sector on a magnetic disk represents 512 of these bytes. It could also be 2,048 bytes on an optical disk. So that's the difference between a magnetic disk and an optical. Newer disks, newer hard drives, have sector sizes of 4,096 bytes. A bad sector is an area of disk that can no longer be used to store data, either caused by malware, corrupted boot records, a physical disruption, or any other number of issues. A cluster is a logical unit on a disk that contains contiguous uh, disk space. Yeah, a logical storage unit that contains contiguous sectors. 
When a disk is partitioned, the number of sectors in a cluster is defined. Clusters could be one, that's 512 kilos, or 128 sectors. These tracks are thin concentric bands on a disk that consist of sectors where data is stored. Because most files are comprised of 512 byte blocks, it's important to understand that an 800 byte file would use two sectors and have file slack or unused bytes in the last sector of a file. So in the example of an 800 byte file, the physical size of the file is actually 1024 bytes or two sectors, but the logical size of the file is 800 bytes. This becomes ever more important when we're examining uh, disks and we're looking at the, the contents of the actual drive. Investigators typically spend their time examining hard disks. Beep. A platter is a circular disk made of aluminum, ceramic, or glass that stores data magnetically. A spindle at the center of a disk is powered by a motor that is used to spin the platters, allowing the actuator arms that have read-write heads to modify the magnetization of the disk when writing. They typically have two heads for each platter since data is written on both sides. Since these heads are nanometers from the platter, they must be handled very carefully and prevent any magnetic device, whether it's a cell phone, a microwave, a magnetic screwdriver, near those platters. A cylinder is the same track on each platter, spanning all platters on a drive. This geometry refers to the structure of a hard disk in terms of platters, tracks, and sectors. The way that storage capacity is calculated is the number of cylinders times the number of heads times the number of sectors times the number of bytes per sector. Moving on to paging. Virtual memory is a feature of most operating systems. The page file is an area on a hard disk that stores an image of the random access memory. In Windows, it's pagefile.sys and it stores frames of data that have been swapped from RAM to the hard disk in order to allow running applications enough room to utilize RAM if it runs low on space. RAM, page file, or any other virtual memory is invaluable to investigators since it contains information about running processes. It'll contain passwords, web browsing artifacts, and any other uh, list of of a volatile information. This is always a treasure trove of information for you when you are looking at a disk and what, what the user was doing at the time of the capture. Investigators like yourselves will need to be able to convert between different numbering formats just due to the way that software displays data. Some files on a computer are in binary format and will need to be converted. It's also good to understand how to convert hexadecimal to ASCII using tables. 
file headers are typically written in hex and can allow you and various tools to identify files even when a suspect changes the extension to hide data. Because some think they're very smart and just instead of JPEG, change it to Word document or whatever, but it's very easy to, uh, to revert back and see that. I don't have the picture of that. Oh, well. the boot process for operating systems. The kernel is at the core of an operating system and is responsible for communication between software and hardware. When a computer is powered on, the computer executes code stored in ROM, referred to the BIOS, or uh, yeah, referred to the BIOS, which initializes system devices. Bootstrapping is the process of running a small piece of code to activate other parts of the OS during the boot process. In modern computers, the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, or UEFI, has replaced BIOS and does the same job. In many examinations, the hard drive is removed to be imaged or cloned. It is important to also document the information about the system and its specifications, because when it comes to uh, court, you have to be able to be as detailed as possible. With a master boot record, the first sector on a hard disk, sector zero, is known as the master boot record, which is involved in the boot process and stores information about the partitions on a disk, including how many exist and their locations. The MBR is comprised of the master partition table, descriptions about the partitions on a disk, the master boot code, which starts the boot process, the disk signature, identifying the disk to the OS, and the end of sector marker. Windows supports five file systems, FAT12, 16, 3264, and NTFS. FAT, or the file allocation table, uses, as the name says, a table to store information about where files are stored, the file space available, and where files cannot be stored. The new technology file system, or NTFS, has replaced FAT. FAT12 is used in floppy disks, and it's universally supported by modern OSs. FAT16 was the 16-bit file system for MS-DOS with file name limits to eight characters, file extensions to three characters, and, a, and disk partition maximums of two gigabyte. FAT32 is, as the name says, a 32-bit version of FAT, handling a maximum file size of four gigabytes. FAT64 is also known as XFAT. It can be recognized by Mac OS, but like its predecessors, it doesn't have the security or journaling, which is a, a file system record, keeping changes made to files in a journal. Uh, it doesn't have that, that feature. NTFS does have file system compression. It supports 16-bit Unicode for international appeal. It has access control lists to enable permissions associated with files and folders, and also journaling. NTFS also maintains an update sequence number, or USN, that'll record things like the time of change, the reason for change, the file directory name, its attributes, the master file table record number, the file record number of the file's parent directory, a security ID, the update sequence number of the record, and information about the source of the change. This whole change journal is hiding in the main uh, folder, like the C drive or D drive, in a uh, file or folder called dollar sign extend. And within that, you'll find a file called dollar sign USR JRNL. The actual journal entries can be retrieved from an alternate data stream. The alternate data stream is a file set, uh, the file set of attributes, allowing files to have multiple data streams that can be viewed only by accessing the master file table. For example, 
when File Explorer will show, while File Explorer will show details about a music file's logical file path in a file system, VLC will use additional data stream to update album information or associate the music file with other music from the same artist. Like I said, the master file table uh, maintains file and folder metadata, including the file name, the creation date, the location, the size, the permissions, the compression, encryption, deletion, and free space to be reallocated for every file and folder. The default size for every entry is 1,024 bytes. The MFT header accounts for 42 bytes and, and the remaining uh, four attributes. These attributes can either can be either resident, like stored, uh, the content will be stored in the MFT record, or non-resident, stored in external clusters. Timestamps in the metadata or MFT can be manipulated or just be wrong. It's always advised to compare two MFT timestamps, the standard information and the file name attribute. While the SIA, the standard information, can be altered, the file name attribute cannot. And on a, on a little side note, I don't know if you are uh, following my Twitter or looking at in the main channels on Discord, the, uh, the news channel. I did post not too long ago a, a blog post of how someone was able to delete a file and create a new one in its place and, uh, and be able to have that new file take the attributes of the deleted file without the user really intervening other than, then here's a, a original file. It has its, its attributes of when it was created. Delete that, create a new one, give it the same name and watch as NTFS gives it the, all the metadata and stuff from the original deleted file, even though they are two different files. Pretty crazy stuff of NTFS. Prefetch files or .pf files increase an application's performance. They contain information like when it was created, the number of times it's been ran, and any files or folders associated with that executable. These files contain timestamps like the last run and volume creation time. From Windows 8 forward, Prefetch has eight timestamps according to the last run times. They are typically stored in the root folder, like C drive or D drive, Windows, Prefetch. I also have in the notes the registry key to find exactly where that is. Superfetch files included in Vista or introduced in Vista, works with memory manager service to increase performance. Superfetch data is stored by the service host. You've seen this program, SVC host.exe, located in the root drive, system32, sysmain.dll. The files are stored in the prefetch directory with prefix ag and extension .db, like database. Shellbags provides users a user viewing preferences for File Explorer. We can see users' sizing and positioning of a folder window, track when folders were viewed by a user, and any other very interesting information. All that hides in registry. And again, in the notes, I have the two locations where you can get that information. Shim cache contains a record of executed binaries and which have been viewed in explore.exe but not executed. 
in XP, there was a maximum of 96 entries kept. In Windows 7, that was raised to 1,024. File metadata stored can also include the full file path, file size, process execution flag, the last update time, and last modify time. And also in the notes, I have the registry key location for that, uh, for Windows XP and up. FireEye actually has a tool called Shim Cache Parser that you can use to obtain uh, the information I just mentioned uh, and output it in a CSV file. So yes, it is totally able to um, totally able to see what's happening. All the all the last programs that run that ran by what user when. Speaking of the registry, the registry is a hierarchical database that stores system configuration information. It maintains files used to control the OS hardware, software, and keep track of users. In terms of evidence, the registry can provide internet searches, sites visited, passwords, and user activity. But also a word of caution, Changes to the registry may cause serious problems to Windows. Think of the registry as the soft underbelly of Windows. There are five major hives, as they call them. There's the classes root. This contains file name extension associations like exe, jpeg, um, mpg, you name it. It also contains the COM objects, visual basic programs, and other automation. COM stands for the component object model. Allows non-programmers to write scripts for managing Windows, uh, for managing Windows. The current user, the second folder in, uh, in registry, contains the user profile for the current profile that is logged into the system when viewed. This folder will change each time a different user logs into the system. That profile has everything from the desktop settings, the network connections, the printers, personal groups. Uh, the, that hive itself really has very little data, but it's, it's more of a pointer to HK users, which we'll get to after local machine. The local machine contains information about the systems settings, including the hardware and software. So things like every USB drive connected to it in, in the time that the OS was installed. All that is stored in local machine. Great when trying to connect a USB drive to a particular system to see was this drive connected to this computer. Just look at the ID of the USB drive and see if you find it within local machine. HK users contains the information about all the registered users on a system. So every account that you make within Windows has a, a folder within H key users. You will find a minimum of three keys. The first is the default, which contains a profile where no users are logged in. There's also a key containing the security ID for the current local user, which could look like something like S1518. Uh, there are keys for the current user and every other that's there. The current config, the last folder, contains information pertaining to the system's hardware that is necessary during the startup process. Within this hive are screen settings, uh, screen resolution, fonts, 
Also, any plug and play information is found within that hive. Uh, lastly, we have some features from Vista 7, 8, or uh, 8.1 and 10 that you should be aware of when you're working with those OSs. For example, in Vista, uh, the automatic defragmentation was brought in. XP and below, you had to manually do it in Vista forward, you're able to automatically defrag a drive. It gives us as investigators a significant decrease in data due to the nature of moving file chunks from one place on the drive to another. Ready Boost was brought in. Any data stored in that USB drive that's used for Ready Boost is encrypted with AES-128 and should be captured on a live system. The volume shadow copy service was introduced. It creates two types of shadow copies. There's the complete or the clone of a volume and copies only the changes to the volume. They're normally stored in that same drive. Also hibernate. Hyperfill.sys is the name of the file. In Windows 7, biometrics was introduced. Biometrics can be used to link a suspect to a series of events. There's uh, the jump lists, a taskbar feature that allows the user to quickly access recently used files or actions. In the notes, I have the location of where that information is saved. There's a backup and restore center that was introduced. This tool provides image backups and can utilize NTFS hard drive volumes. There's BitLocker to go. Uh, the advanced version of the tool brought in and in Vista. Uh, there is touch screen. So uh, key loggers are not an end all solution from this point forward. Sticky notes could contain information about or important information saved by a suspect. Along with some new additions within the registry. Uh, in Windows 7, the private internet browsing was introduced. File grouping is also a interesting, uh, interesting feature that was added. It allows us uh, faster searching because information will be indexed. So we can just look at the index rather than just searching through the entire drive for uh, possible evidence. There's even a federated search where you can query external data sources like database of web content. From seven to eight to 8.1, uh, most of the evidence locations were unchanged with exception that 8.1 introduced picture password, allowing a user to select a photo with a series of gestures to unlock the computer and deleted files are usually found in the dollar sign recycle.bin folder. Windows 10 continued all these things and added three more. Added notification messages, which again, the location of where you can find all, the, all those messages is in the notes. There's Edge Browser, which will be dying soon and also Cortana, which I think they said they were gonna kill off soon as well. But either way, uh, all those places can have 
evidentiary information. So it's good to know where it is. And that's why I have placed in the notes the long, uh, to long location where those things are. Any questions? Okay, so I look through Zoom, look at Discord and YouTube. Sure, I can post the Discord link in the chat. You can also see it within Canvas in the orientation module. Okay, so seeing none, let's talk about what we'll be doing this week. Like I said last week, yes, there are due dates for assignments. But if and when life happens, don't freak out. Just simply get it done when you can. You have until this date and time to submit all work with no penalty for uh, late submission. Uh, I, I've always hated that, that stupid penalty for late submission. So I'm not gonna do that to you, but I will say you have until December 7th, 11.59 PM to submit any and all work before the door will close and no work will be accepted. This week, you'll be doing two different things. The first one is playing the binary games from Sam. My uh, advice to you, is complete all of them from 101, 102, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. When you have the answers to all seven, then begin the quiz. Because all that you'll be doing, and, and I have uh, no shame in showing you, all that you'll be doing is putting the answers in Canvas. So please don't think that you have to solve 101 and then do the quiz. Solve them all. When you have them all solved, you have all seven answers, then begin the quiz, because all you're going to do is copy paste the answer that you got in here. So no, no trick questions. You're seeing what they are. But again, all you have to do is complete the seven, say, put the answers that you get in a text file or something. And when you have all seven, then, then start the quiz and submit them. The other thing you'll do is, uh, either use your own Windows machine or create one on GCP. Play with it, open stuff, download things, make, make some noise, and then look at the things, the places that we talked about, like registry, the, the shim cache, the, uh, the, the where Windows stores, what files were open when, what executables were viewed but not ran, and see, see what you see. And all that you're doing, all that you're submitting is, is what you saw. Again, like with all my assignments, this is not saying you have to write a 20 page paper. Absolutely not, absolutely not. Um, you just simply write what you see. If that takes half a page to say, hey, I, I got the, the shim cache tool from FireEye. 
after I used a Windows VM for an hour and just just did stuff. And here is the list. I here's the things I saw. That's that's perfectly fine. Again, it's not uh, it's not some in depth investigation. It's more of an observation. What do you see? And what does that change your view of Windows? Does it make you more paranoid? Or does it make you just shrug and go, yeah, I knew this all along? You are welcome to use Velociraptor and Scotty if you'd like. Um, it's not a requirement because again, th this, is, this is more of an observation where you may not have heard of those locations that exist in Windows. Now you did. Uh, let your curiosity run wild. Check those files out. Check those locations out. See, see what you see. And then in your in the thing you submit, you know, does that? What do you think about that? And again, what you think about that doesn't mean a five-page paper. It could be a paragraph, because that's that is your response. So any questions on the work for this week? Well, if you start crying or start feeling like you're going to cry, please, please, please ask away on Discord. That's why we have it. That's why it's there. Please ask for help on Discord. <laughs> 